In studio, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William. Good morning again, Rob. Great to be here as always. Maria Lawrence and Maria. Good morning. And via telephone, Glenn Elliott, candidate for U.S. Senate, as we are now just a day under two weeks from Election Day. Uh, Glenn, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning, Rob. It's great to be here. Uh, so how is your day going so far, sir? <laughs> well, it's just getting started, but, uh, you know, we're down in that under under two-week period now with early voting beginning, so it's pretty much pedal to the metal to the finish line. We've been running this campaign, of a, very much a grassroots campaign, being everywhere we can for the last eight months now, and we're not going to let up. How are you doing with name recognition around the state now, Glenn? I know that was an it's issue improving. for you when you declared. <laughs> Well, it certainly was uh, my biggest hurdle, um, and it's definitely improving. Um, you know, we've tried to be everywhere. Uh, we're going to have some ads coming out here, uh, getting on TV soon to help us out a little bit. But uh, the name recognition part, you know, we've we've tried to go everywhere we can, meet people, knock on doors, and have town halls. We've been to all 55 counties, knocked on doors everywhere, talked to thousands and thousands of voters, including Republicans and independents uh, who may not be inclined to vote uh, for me because of the letter next to my name. And I feel like uh, the word of mouth, the name recognition is getting around. Uh, coupled that to the fact that my opponent seems to stay in the news for a lot of wrong reasons, not paying bills, not paying taxes, <laughs> um, you know, missing, uh, you know, uh, just avoiding foreclosure of his signature property. Uh, so that's helping as well. And uh, look, I know the polls early on suggested this race was, was out of reach, but I really feel like we've closed a lot, and uh, we'll see here in the next two weeks if we can close out strong. Are you teaming up at all with the other major Democratic Party candidates in the state, like uh, Steve Williams or Steve Wendland? Uh, Steve Williams and I have had a lot of joint appearances. We were just together here. I, I, I'm in Charleston this morning. Last night we had, uh, uh, were at the same event last night. Steve and I have similar stories to tell, uh, both being mayors of cities that have made a really impressive comeback, he being in, uh, the mayor of Huntington and me being the former mayor of Wheeling. Uh, so I think we pair up very well. I've also made some appearances with Steve Wendelin uh, up in the um, – uh, Congressional District 2, as well as other statewide candidates. Uh, we've seen a lot of each each other of this campaign to the point where we could probably finish each, uh, finish each other's uh, stump speech. Uh, but it's been great getting out and about and uh, seeing a lot of people showing up just to, uh, for meet and greets in town halls. Uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't expect... Um, uh, uh, so many uh, folks to show up at our town halls and meet and greets that they thought we didn't have a chance to win. I really feel like... Um, I really feel like there is... Uh, sort of a silent majority of folks out there who just aren't aren't satisfied with the status quo in West Virginia and looking for something different. Have you had any more success with the National Democratic Party <laughs> and national fundraisers in terms of getting campaign money for your race in West Virginia? Uh, uh, we haven't really had a lot of support from the National Democratic Party. You know, they looked at this race early, uh, but I think like a lot of folks, they lack the imagination to think that Democrats can win in West Virginia. They think we are a state that is too... Uh, too hopelessly red. And, you know, I, I've tried to make the case to them that, uh, uh, you know, our state is very much um, a support for former President Trump remains very, very strong. But support for a lot of the other Republicans uh, down the ballot is much less so. And I know, at least in the case of my opponent, there's a lot of Republicans who are going to vote for President Trump uh, who are not going to vote for Jim Justice because they just don't respect the way he does business. And I think um, you know, I, I, we tried to make that case nationally, um, you know, uh, but at the same time, uh, we're not really letting that bother us. Uh, we've raised a fair amount of money from small donations for folks all across the country who are concerned about the Senate seat and, uh, you know, don't want to see uh, don't want to see this Senate seat go to someone like Jim Justice, who, quite frankly, uh, doesn't have the temperament, doesn't have the like really the interest in the job and is even going to show up for this job. You know, West Virginia in particular, uh, you know, deserves to have two senators in the Senate, not one and a half senators like we would have if we elected uh, Governor Justice. So I think a lot of folks uh, believe in this campaign. The question is just going to be, you know, if voters come through on Election Day, actually starting today. So, um, you know, we are going to be everywhere we can over the next 13 days to make the case. Bill? Yeah, good morning, Glenn. Uh, Visibility is uh, is important. Uh, I'm looking at the latest poll that I have access to, and that was in uh, late August of Research America that yep. shows you about 34 points down, uh, and that's a <laughs> yeah. little that's a little bit uh, worse than what it was in June. Do you have private polls, private quantitative numbers, Glenn, that would uh, give you more optimism than what this uh, this August poll would say? Uh, Yes, we do, Bill. Uh, that poll in August, uh, to me, is not even 
Um, it suggested that I lost ground over the summer, and it, and it suggested that Governor Justice is more popular than Donald Trump in West Virginia. And I can tell you with 100 percent certainty, um, you know, neither of those is true. We have internal polling we've done um, in August, actually around the same time that poll was done. That you know, this showed me down about 20 something points, but at the same time, it showed that my biggest challenge was just a lot of folks didn't know who I was. And that's what we've been trying to do ever since. Just close the name recognition gap just a little bit. So folks know that there's a competent alternative out there. Obviously the governor enjoys a pretty much universal name recognition. Uh, but what we found, it's kind of interesting. What we found around the state is the more people know Jim Justice and, uh, and people in the Southern part of the state, especially people in Greenbrier and Raleigh counties who really know him, uh, the less they like him. So my challenge has been twofold sort of getting people to know who I am and also getting people to know who Jim Justice really is, not the guy who shows up with the uh, folksy platitudes and uh, and dogs for a photo op, uh, but actually the guy like, who he really is, how he does business, how he treats people, how he doesn't respect the process. The more people that get to know that, I think it really improves my chances, uh, but they have to know that I exist as well. So that's what we've been trying to do on neighborhood recognition. Okay, following up on that very quickly, you mentioned you're going to be putting some ads out uh, the next day or yep. so. Uh, are you going to target a particular part of the state? Or are you going to be... Uh, kind- certainly, yeah. uh, you know, our budgeting is not going to be what the governor's is, so we're going to be much more targeted and careful in what we do put out on TV, um, uh, uh, picking markets a little bit carefully. You know, we found from our 55-county tour uh, that, you know, different parts of the states are very, uh, you know, I like different aspects of my history, of my experience, and my work ethic. So, you know, we're going to make that case as best as we can. Uh, we're also not just relying on TV, though. I mean, we've got mailers going out. We have a lot of digital ads. Uh, we have postcards going out. Um, you know, we just did an open letter to West Virginia Republicans, which you can find on my website, Elliot for WV.com, uh, that really – uh, you know, makes the case, so we're actually mailing this letter out as well. We put it on our website. We put it in some newspapers. Makes the case that if you're a Republican um, and thinking about voting in this election, uh, Jim Justice embodies almost none of the values that you actually really care about, especially chief among them is personal responsibility. Uh, look at the way the man has, has lived his life, having been born into great wealth and now finding himself uh, uh, frequently, you know, at the foreclosure uh, deadlines, not paying his debts, not paying his creditors, not being able to get a loan from anywhere in the Western Hemisphere right now. He had to go uh, to the Middle East to get, uh, get bailed out for this last thing. Is that a guy you want to send to the Senate? And the point we make in that letter is, uh, look, you know, if you elect me, there's going to be a couple times a year when I vote in a way that probably makes you angry. Uh, but it's the other 360 days in Washington that I'll be there fighting for West Virginia that Jim Justice is not going to even show up. He's telling people privately he's not going to be in D.C. more than 14 days a month and doesn't want to be on any committees. And that is exactly not how, how to be effective as a U.S. senator. Um, and, you know, I can say this. If you send me there, I'm going to be a senator for everybody. I'm not just going to be a senator for one party. Like I said, the National Democratic Party is not helping me at all. I'm certainly not going to be beholden to anybody if I get elected. Most of me, uh, you know, most or actually all of my supports come from uh, just really from individuals. A couple of unions have, have supported me, but I don't have all the all sort of the big corporate interests backing me like uh, Governor Justice does. So I'll be a senator for everybody. I'm certainly not an ideologue. You know, as mayor of Wheeling, I was very bipartisan. And, uh, you know, I really think if you're a Republican actually looking at this race, you have to look at who's going to be best for West Virginia, uh, not just how someone might vote on a couple of cultural war issues that surely come up from time to time, but who's going to be the best for the long term interests of this state. So, Glenn, the governor has commented that all of the all of the media uproar about the bankruptcies and the sale of the Greenbrier and not being able to secure a loan is all political. And I can only imagine then that he's pointing the finger at you. Um, What do you have to say about that? Well, because we all know the banks are so uh, so democratic leaning in their organization. I mean, that's just laughable. Uh, The governor has benefited uh, from his incumbency more than he's being targeted because of it. Uh, You know, uh, case in point, if you're a small business owner that sells alcohol products or has uh, lottery products in your business and you don't actually make a sales tax payment to the state as required under law, uh, you, uh, 
Uh, those licenses are taken away immediately, and you lose your certificate of good standing. He's been operating the Greenbrier for months and months and months, uh, selling alcohol and actually having a lottery there, uh, despite being about $3.5 million delinquent and turning over sales taxes, money that was never his to begin with that he took and used for something else. Uh, he is benefiting from his incumbency and his position in politics, uh, not uh, much more than he's being targeted for. The idea that I'm behind some effort uh, uh, to get banks to go after him, come on, banks aren't supporting Democrats candidates we know that it's just it's just talk uh, he talks like uh, you know he he talks in a very reassuring and folksy way but if you actually listen to what he says it's almost meaningless it's a very little substance comes out of what he says it's just the way he says it pe- people find reassuring if they actually listen to what he said you take away all the folksy platitudes there's not much there and and talk a little bit about the key issues that you're focusing on. Let's sort of veer yeah. clear of um, of Governor Justice for a minute. Um, sure. Reproductive rights is that something that Absolutely. people are um, women in particular are talking to you and your campaign about? It it comes up at every town hall and every meeting greet we've had. Uh, uh, look, I know it's a controversial issue. It's a tough issue for a lot of voters. Um, But look, Roe v. Wade was the law of the land for just about 50 years. It wasn't perfect, but it gave... it gave everybody involved, you know, some predictability. It separated pregnancies into trimesters where early on women had complete autonomy over their bodies. As time went on, then the state took an interest in the life of the unborn child. That, to me, was a fair balance. What we've done now in West Virginia, and the governor, of course, signed this into law, is, is we've taken that right away from women, and we've said the state knows best what's, be- uh, what's best for you, and we've injected government into women's examination rooms. That is having a real impact, and I've talked to young women across the state who who – I don't really feel like they have the rights their mothers and grandmothers had in West Virginia now. And it, it, for a state that struggles with population loss, it's a huge issue. I recognize for some folks this is a deal-breaker issue, but at the end of the day, um, look, I'm not in favor of abortion as a that, as a way to basically do birth control. I don't think anybody should be pro-abortion, but you know, there's a lot of reasons why having a pregnancy can put a woman in a very tough situation if she's in a tough relationship with a... Got sort of an abusive partner. Uh, she's already got uh, several kids and can't afford another. She doesn't have access to child care. And so compelling women to have actually actually carry children uh, to term uh, when they don't have the resources in place in a state that lacks child care, a state that lacks a foster care system uh, to depend on, is just not right. And it's it's superimposing gov- what the government thinks is best for what people think the best. I trust women to make their best decisions. And for me, this issue, I think there's going to be a lot of voters on Election Day who Uh, who show up on this issue in particular, yes. Glenn Elliott is our guest, candidate for the U.S. Senate seat that is currently held by uh, Senator Joe Manchin, who will obviously not be returning to office. I read a report yesterday, Glenn, that said by 2033, Social Security will be able to pay out 79% of the benefits uh, because uh, of the uh, trust fund depletion. At some point along the way, members of the Senate and the House and in the White House have to tackle the Social Security Medicare issue that's looming over this nation and its retiring population. What can Senator Glenn Elliott do about this? <laughs> uh, well, thanks for that question, Rob. You know, no state is more dependent on Social Security and Medicare than we are right now. You know, we have a very old population. I think one of the oldest populations in the country. We, uh, uh, you know, I've lost track of the people I've talked to who who bring up those issues when we're talking to them. And uh, first and foremost, what we have to do in the Senate, what we have to do on, on absolutely going forward is get back to the regular order of budgeting. It gets in the weeds a little bit, but the way we do budgeting now is we basically, uh, you know, we don't follow the congressional budget process set up in the 1970s and, and have the 13 appropriations bills and the annual budget resolutions uh, where you actually look at things in five and ten year windows and make sure that everything is paid for going forward. What we end up doing are these uh, sort of last minute um, you know, omnibus bills or continuing resolutions where everything is just lumped in there. Most of of current law uh, spending is preserved. They make a couple a, a couple tweaks. Uh, no one gets to see it before it's voted on. It, it's printed out the day before. It's just the most irresponsible way to do budgeting. So you can't have the conversations about how to preserve Social Security, Medicare 
in a budget context like that. So we have to get back to regular order budgeting. There's some tough choices that have to be made. Uh, to, uh, we need to look at ways to bring in more revenue on the FICA tax side. You know, we stop uh, stop taking out uh, FICA tax around 168 or $167,000 of income. Um, you know, that needs to go up a little bit. If you're if you're Elon Musk, you know, you should you should be paying a little bit more into Social Security. Uh, uh, you know, it, uh, you've done well for this country. You should pay a little bit more into Social Security. We shouldn't actually stop taking that out. We have to look at getting more people actually working uh, to pay for the, uh, uh, you know, the retirees that we have now. And our state is number uh, 50 in workforce participation. So we've got to get more people into the workforce. We've got to fix our immigration system. We have a lot of people being paid under the table right now who aren't even paying into Social Security. Uh, we, we absolutely have to fix immigration. Now, that's a big issue for a lot of folks. Uh, there's a lot of fear mongering on that issue on the other side. But for me, it's, it's a practical issue. We have people who want to come here and live legally and work. Oh, we got to get them paying into Social, into Social Security because right now we're seeing with all the baby boomers retiring, uh, we're seeing a lot of strands on that program. They're, they talk about a trust fund, but the trust fund is just an accounting gimmick. It's not, there's, uh, there's not actually money sitting in any account in D.C. Uh, uh, basically, Social Security has been funded on a pay-as-you-go system since it was – uh, since it was implemented, it, it made a lot of sense in the 1930s because life expectancy was about 60 then. So if you didn't get benefits till 65, it was a pretty good deal uh, for the government. Now with people living a lot, lot longer, which is a good thing, we have to make sure those benefits are available for folks. And that's not going to happen if we don't get back to doing budgeting in a responsible, grown-up way. Bill, uh, yeah, Glenn, uh, with the polarization we have in our country but especially we have in congress yeah. it's hard to get anything done uh the filibuster yeah. came up as an issue uh early in the last uh a uh, couple so years ago uh senator joe manchin uh v uh, stopped the filibuster from going through uh, uh kamala harris has said she would propose a filibuster or getting rid of the filibuster what is senator elliott's view on the filibuster <laughs> Oh, well, this is something, though, I have to admit that over the years, my views have changed a little bit. Working for Byrd, uh, Senator Byrd, as I did for five years to start my career, I saw the I saw the power of the filibuster. I saw the importance. I saw its significance and had a lot of appreciation for it. And I actually have a ton of respect for Senator Manchin, and I, and I appreciate his position on it now. But the problem with the filibuster right now is it used to be used only in those extreme situations where a particular senator had – uh, you know, some uh, beef with this issue and wanted to make it, uh, you know, wanted to take the Senate floor and stand there and protest. Uh, you know, that sh like that right should exist. You know, senators should have the right to d actually take the floor and force conversations about tough issues. But the filibusters become the de facto rule for all legislation now, where you need 60 votes to do anything. And that is never what the founders would have intended. Uh, so I'd like to see the filibuster preserve, but made a actually, if you want to use it, you have to actually physically be on the floor speaking. It can't just be used as a procedural matter on everything the way it's done right now, uh, because it has stopped a lot of stuff from getting done. And one of the reasons people have so little faith in Congress and, uh, and Congress polls below just about everything else in public opinion polls is because it can't it, it can't deliver solutions. Uh, the filibuster has become a big reason for that. That was never what it was intended to be. Um, you know, the Senate is special. I think the Senate should be a place for debate. Uh, but have that debate on the floor. Don't just rely on some procedural motion of basically for 60 votes on every issue and get nothing done. So I would be open to actually reforming the filibuster, not getting away with it, but making it much more, uh, let's just say, painful to actually implement. You can't just, I just can't rely on it as a default as the default for every piece of legislation. It is stunting our ability to solve problems. Maria. So you're in Charleston today, Glenn. When are you heading back to yeah. the Eastern Panhandle? I think we're in the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, I think we're heading there on Saturday morning. And uh, we're going to be in Lewisburg tomorrow. And then I think uh, back in Wheeling for a little bit. And then Eastern Panhandle Saturday morning. We've been over there a lot. We just acted with just in Hardy County, what was it, three days ago for a, a meet and greet. Um, we'll be back in Jefferson and Berkeley, I believe, uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday this weekend. And, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to be everywhere we can. Um, it's a very challenging state to drive around in, as you all know. Um, you know, from Charleston to Eastern Panhandle is a long drive. From Wheeling to anywhere in West Virginia is pretty much a long drive, we've come to realize. As we put about 40,000 miles on on both my car and my, and my wife's car over the course of this campaign, but it's been an incredible experience. So I look forward to getting back over there. Uh, you guys have the 
uh, you know, the only part of the state with actual population growth. So it presents an exact opposite set of challenges from most of the state, which is seeing consistent population decline. And uh, so that's, it's a good thing, obviously, but it does create some challenges for, from an infrastructure perspective as well. And I know that you're all familiar with that as well. So it, it's always good to talk to folks over there. And, uh, you know, we'll be back there soon. How do you change a campaign? You've got like 30 seconds now. Um, from <laughs> uh, how do you restructure with the early voting um, piece uh, weighing in? Well, obviously, uh, getting out to vote is the key thing you got to do right now. Um, you know, and, and, and we're going to be working on that. You know, a lot of folks um, will like to vote on election day, but for me, uh, you know, I encourage folks to vote early if you can. You never know if you're going to get sick or something's going to come up, or election day, uh, there could be bad weather. Uh, make sure your vote is heard. So I encourage folks to go vote early. I like to vote early myself, although as a candidate, it, Sometimes there is something nice about that actually doing on Election Day. But uh, so now, you know, we focus a lot on just getting people out to vote and actually reminding people that they can vote. Um, and so that's kind of the, the main thing you do right now is just start to focus on getting out the vote efforts. Glenn, you you mentioned there are several parts of the state. Only 30 uh, seconds. Bill. Yeah. Uh, which part of the state are you targeting right now that you think you can make a real difference in for election? We're spending, honestly, you know, uh, uh, Charleston South, uh, everywhere south of Charleston is kind of where we spend a lot of time. Uh, just because folks don't know me as well there, uh, uh, you know, and people do tend to know Jim Justice very well here. So we've spent a lot of time here. Uh, but between that and the Eastern Panhandle, where we're not nearly well as known. Uh, That's well known, I think you meant to say yeah. before his phone died. Yeah. Yeah. People know me in that area. There you go. Uh, so it's basically just you know getting our name recognition, our name recognition up in places where they don't know me as well. Glenn, thanks so much. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, yeah, appreciate it, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Glenn. Glenn Elliott at nine fifty-seven. We are back with the final minute after these. <laughs>